materials. Now I gave you a physical copy and the old way of doing it is to write. Guys, here right on the corner, if you came in late, please grab the worksheet. Thank you. And if anybody could just cue the people as they're parading in. Yeah, it's all one. So that you could write, write things on the back. Um, some of you and your technology is good to the point where you could just open up the PDF and then you can still type on it. So if that's how you prefer to do it, then this worksheet that I just handed to you is called Review Worksheet 2, Return of the Review. All right, so that's what it looks like. And we're gonna, gonna, we're gonna go piece by piece here. And remember, the best thing for us to do, and this will be the hardest one, uh, is to cover this worksheet and then take a break and then hit the last one. All right, the last one goes a little bit faster, especially when we get past the war, um, the First World War, I guess. Isn't that the 1715 one? Oh, here, take the. It, you should have one called the Return of the Review, right? Is that you? Oh, wait, what? Yeah. Oh, wait. Which one am I taking? What? Dude, I have this. Dude, all right. Dude. Cool. Yeah. All right, so, I think there should be enough for everybody. Hmm? I definitely Maybe? Like 30 people here. No. <laughs> no. I definitely thought there'd be like Um, Because I didn't say bonus points, and then, you know, nobody should. That's how should. you can weed out the fake ones. But <laughs> I'm still giving you bonus points. Screw them for not coming. It's no problem. Jason. Oh, true. I just uh, like Jason. Jason's AP Euro game has gone up dramatically. That's actually true. The last, <laughs> the last, <laughs> three, the the last three or four games, Jason's like. Yeah. Yeah. Jason's <laughs> catapulting. Well, I'm eating your food right now. Okay. <laughs> Let's get going. So, this is how we do this. Um, like I said, if you're comfortable writing, which I still think is good because it kind of engages you, and if you're not writing, you're definitely typing, and if you can figure out technologically how to just type onto the draft uh, that's in your folder, then that's Thank good you. too. Everybody good? All right, so we start. Um, where we left off was roughly Utrecht. I think that was the last thing that was in that last set of notes. Um, so this one starts out kind of picking up where that left off. We're looking at the 18th century. And remember I told you about like the snapshots. You know, it's the 1700s, that's what the 18th century is. And uh, this is what we see. Did you? Did you kill it? You're going to say right? Yeah. You killed it. What did you kill? The 800. Everyone. <laughs> you killed the 800? I did. Why is it just me? You destroyed it? You slayed it? Every single one. You ran it in uh, 146? <laughs> Not quite. Too no. Ooh, that's good. Not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make the cop. All right. So, politically then, this is kind of what we're looking at. You know, and this, remember, this is the 1700s, so there's been some changes, but it says the aspects of the global economy. So number one, politically, we say um, that if you're looking at the 1700s, the dominant political situation is um, dynastic. What that means is monarchies. It's another way of saying that. What you see is monarchies pretty much everywhere. Um, the, the exception to that is Holland or the Netherlands, or the Low Countries, or whatever you want to call them. And England, remember, at the end of the, or actually, no, at the end of the 17th century, becomes a constitutional government. So every place else is some form of absolutist system or some form of monarchical system, certainly not a constitution. England and the Dutch are the exception. 
Economically, it said mercantile empires dominated the Atlantic seaboard. And there's, really there's four. There's Spain, there's the Netherlands, there's England, and there's France. Um, everybody else is probably agrarian uh, and not that involved in commerce. Socially, um, you're, you're starting to witness the growth of the bourgeoisie. Uh, particularly in the, in the states that I just talked about, uh, but particularly the Netherlands, England, and France, uh, because that, that expansion, that global expansion, that commerce, is starting to produce what they call a mercantile class. All right? um, conflicts. There's a handful, all right? and, and here I would probably just write them down. Um, <coughs> There, the first one was, the big one, was the one that we just finished with, and that was called the War of Spanish Succession. All right? And it bears characteristics, very similar characteristics to an 18th century conflict, because um, there's continental stuff going on, but there's also um, colonial or commercial stuff going on. So the War of Spanish Succession, remember, ends with Utrecht in 1713, and remember, Britain starts to carve out an empire, um, starting to gain stuff. Stuff that France had control of, stuff that Spain had control of. Um, so that's the first couple of things. Uh, this is going to get tedious here. Just pass these back to these youngsters as they show up. Right. The reason why I think it's important to make sure that you get some of the specifics down is because you never know when you're going to get an essay like this, all right, where you have to look at conflicts in the middle of the 18th century, or at least know what's going on. Then remember there was a bunch, and they were actually in a chapter of the Yale. One was called the War of Jenkins' Ear. One was called the War of Austrian Succession. One was called the Seven Years' War. So pretty much from 1739 to 1763, there's two wars on the continent that kind of pit Austria versus Prussia. And then there's wars around the world, basically, uh, that pit France and to some extent Spain against Great Britain. And some of you remember like the French and Indian War. Uh, the other one was called King George's War. But this is where... Britain is starting to muscle its way into becoming the big commercial colonial empire. Right. So there you go. Um, it says new balance of power. And so the first place that we saw that, um, and really just this is just descriptive. It says more formalized alliance systems designed to check any temps, attempts at hegemony by major powers and that this started to become sort of the norm. And we witnessed it really specifically when they were dealing with Louis, all right, where the Netherlands, Austria, Prussia, England all kind of ganged together uh, to make sure that Louis was contained. And then in the middle of the 18th century, it was kind of like that. Britain is sort of like the, the up and coming commercial power and the, the uh, French and the Spanish to some degree we're working together to try to offset that influence. Right. Um, and then the same thing goes between Austria and Prussia. It's kind of like everybody was taking a temperature. So like a France or a Russia or whatever, they might have been pro-Austria, I'm sorry, pro-Prussia the first go around, but the second go around when Prussia looked stronger than Austria, then they allied with France. So that's kind of how it went. Okay, <laughs> now we get to the Enlightenment. And this is all they really gave us here. So obviously we've got some work to do, and I've got a separate set of notes for that. And that's where we'll spend a little bit of time. Um, so the description is that it is an intellectual revolution in the 18th century. There's really not a whole lot to that. It challenged everything, basically. But remember, the big core idea of the Enlightenment is that um, now that the scientific revolution has provided the capacity for people to discover the laws that govern human nature, the belief was that they could take that same mentality 
rationality, reason, and start to reconfigure the laws that govern human society, all right, or the institutions that shape society. So the objectives is that. You're literally trying to create a, a society that is more, a, a, I guess, aligned with rational principles. All right, so your governing structures, um, your you know, economic system, your criminal justice system, your education system, your religion, you know, which kind of becomes the, that deistic philosophy, but you're trying to recalibrate all of those different things. The connections between the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment should be obvious. All right, it's the 18th century is the Enlightenment, an intellectual movement that is based off of what occurred in the 17th century uh, with the scientists. So, you know, you guys are pretty familiar with, uh, you know, Copernicus through Newton and then uh, Descartes and uh, Bacon, because I think I've seen it in some of the work that you guys have written this week. Oh, I forgot to mention the reason why Hasid was unique, because he's the only person in sixth period that did a different essay than the 1450 to 16 versus the eight. Yeah, he's the only one that did something that everybody else didn't do. So major kudos to Hasid for, for thinking outside the box. Now the first one was the I talked about the scientific. All right, back to what we were doing. Um, <laughs> it's at this point that I would take a little bit of a break, and then if we hit these things again, it's okay. I want you to understand how the Enlightenment works. I think you can fit, fit it into a lot of different things on the board exam. So we scroll out of this, and then we look for the section that I've got here called the Enlightenment um, Study Guide Better Copy. Yeah, it's in the board exam review materials like, section. No, like in, in the packet you gave us. Or no. no, it's not in the packet. So this is something that is supplementing what we're doing in the packet. Okay, it's just like the first review. That's what we're doing. You don't need to grab anything. No, I just want to paper. Oh. Oh, I have paper. There's like the can back. I use this? Yeah, that's fine. Or you can use the back. That's oh. why I made these as large as they were. So if you get to that part, you can put turn it around and put it on the back. I just want to show you what I've got for this, um, which was literally to break down the Enlightenment the way that we broke down the Enlightenment when we learned it. And I gave you like eight different essay questions and then kind of how everybody sort of fits into those the mold of those essays. So if you remember, the first one was looking at religion versus science, and that we had you know specific groups one was trying to find compatibility between religion and science, and that was Blaise Pascal, Spinoza, Rene Descartes, Isaac Newton. These are people that believe that there is room for God and reason, or faith and science, or whatever you want to talk about. Okay, um, And I tried to, as much as I could remember, I tried to, to put the titles of the works in there as well. Okay, The Deists was sort of the main, kind of the moderate group, um, Voltaire, Diderot, Thomas Paine, Ben Franklin, Montesquieu, a whole bunch of others. This really is kind of like the enlightened philosoph statement on religion. All right, it would be good to remember what deism was. Remember? Does anybody remember? Jerome? Is it like God's a giant couch potato? He just had a bunch of rules. Like That's good. I like it. God as the the quintessence quintessential couch potato, all right? But God creates this, this perfect thing, this perfectly ordered machine thing called the universe, and then kind of sits back and watches. But it takes the idea, it, it really is kind of like a, a direct refutation of like the, the Calvin or the Saint Augustine who believe that God is kind of like controlling every little thing that happens. All right? So it's the ultimate assertion of free will. Um, but God's kind of a disinterested actor. He's just kind of watching what happens, you know. Which is unfortunate because I mean, anybody like even if you're watching a ball game, sometimes you start screaming at the ball game, you know. So I wonder if like God's like, oh, come on, no, you know. If he does that like fifty thousand times a day. <laughs> All right, empiricists, Hume and Locke, and this is where they start getting back to the idea that. 
stop with all of this craziness and just deal with the fact that you've got some empirics that are verifiable. Your sensate experiences can engage in the things that they can interact with, and everything else is pretty much, you know, to quote the the the, the great Joe Biden, it's just a bunch of malarkey. Okay, empiricism is just that. It's what you can see, what you can touch, what you can taste. That's what's real. Okay, so Descartes with his mind and matter, that doesn't work for them. All right. And then Halbach and Matrian, that's where we get really far left. And even for their own time, they're really far left. Like, atheism is not like an accepted thing at the, at the salon. You know, maybe at Berkeley now. Uh, but certainly not then. Uh, but Halbach and Matri were, you know, the ones that took it to the, the extreme to say that, like, religion in any capacity is really just a fiction that humanity made up to make, make them feel better. All right. Um, and then the skepticists, or skeptics dash religious and cultural uh, toleration group. All right. And Voltaire, of course, you'll see on, in a variety of different places on this, this graph. But these are people that are rejecting, you know, and that's one of the other main things of science, and I think some people that wrote about that in first period uh, made that a very clear point, was the, the idea that you're not accepting things on faith, that everything deserves rational and critical thinking. Um, and so they're kind of dismissive of, this, you know, people making assertions. And I would say that Montaigne was the beginning of that because he was writing in the middle of the French Civil War and a lot of craziness where people were killing each other in the name of Jesus and, you know, or uh, there were persecutions and enslavements in the New World and he's like, this doesn't make any sense. You know, people are asserting, you know, that this religion is better than this religion or this interpretation is better than this interpretation and you're killing people over these really unverifiable claims. And with that in mind, they're at least big enough to say, if we don't know with absolute certainty about certain things, we have to be receptive of other people's viewpoints. Okay, dogma is the thing they hated the most. And we know that Voltaire was, you know, for the most part, was one of the most uh, prolific writers about those type of things. Remember, uh, we talked about it in the Enlightenment a lot. Ignorance, superstition, prejudice, tyranny. Okay, those are the kind of things that really set society back. And they believe that the Enlightenment was a way of kind of unshackling from those things, those barriers uh, to societal progress. Um, so anyway, that's the group that kind of falls into that category. The next group uh, was the scientific cheerleaders. Um, and then also kind of picking up on the idea that the Enlightenment believed that there was progress that could be made if they could reduce those barriers, if they could rely on a rational, critical way of thinking that, and, and then recalibrate the institutions that shaped individuals, they felt like they could really do some good. All right? And that they really understood like Newtonian physics or Galileo or some of these things had really kind of, you know, it's almost like unfroze everybody. So now the people have the capacity to really, really change. Um, and so Fontenelle and Pope and Condor say we're the people that fall in that category. Politics, this is probably one of the more well-known. Um, we don't include Hobbes, all right, because Hobbes was a century before these guys. Um, but all of them in their own special way are acknowledging that like the old tyrannical or authoritarian structures of governance didn't work. But they had different blueprints about how they would seek, seek to change it. All right, so the more radical end of it was Rousseau, uh, who was arguing for really popular sovereignty. The middle of the line was Locke and Montesquieu, who were kind of looking more at the classical Republican model, which is individual liberties and then reciprocal obligations between governments and individuals. We talked about Locke a lot. And Locke becomes very foundational for really what, if the Enlightenment sort of has a vision about what, the, what, what government would look like, I mean, Locke is really kind of the mouthpiece of that. And then Voltaire, who doesn't really have enough faith uh, in the way that Locke did, who believes that people are generally good, even in the state of nature, they're decent, rational people. 
Um, Voltaire is kind of like, no, most of them are kind of ninnies. And um, they, you know, if, if enlightenment's going to happen, it, you know, the, the elite basically have to take the ideas from the enlightenment and kind of thrust them upon people. You know, it's, it's much more paternalistic. Uh, but it is enlightenment. It's, the, it's like the Frederick the Great or the Catherines or the Josephs of the world are the ones that are going to have to make change. Okay? So some of them are rebels. Gave you some names and hopefully a few works that reflected that ism. Okay, so conservatives, remember, when we say conservatism in the 19th century, uh, you guys just had the Bismarck DBQ. We know what, what kind of conservatism we're talking about. Okay? Uh, classical liberalism, that is the bourgeois phase of the French Revolution. That's Locke. You know, that's Adam Smith. That's the whole American history, basically. Um, they are the middle class benefactors of both the political and the economic revolutions. They cared about representative government. They cared about individual liberties. They cared about laissez-faire economics. They're also the people that would have been anti-welfareist, meaning that if poor people are poor, they deserve to be poor because they're not trying hard enough. Okay? The Lord helps those that help themselves. All right? Your foundation for classical liberalism on the economic end is Adam Smith, on the political end is John Locke, The Wealth of Nations, Two Treatises of Civil Government. Then you have the Poor People Breed Themselves into Poverty Economists, David Ricardo and Thomas Malthus. You have Samuel Smiles, the guy that's basically said the middle class bourgeois Puritan attributes that made America what it is. Work hard, early to bed, early to rise, save your money, okay? All of those things, you know, sweat of my brow, I will plant, you know, that's what makes greatness, okay? Um, I, I wrote down anybody in America. Uh, and then I wrote down the Whig Party in England because that is the merchant class in England. You know, they're the ones that would have identified mostly by Puritan ideals. Okay. The modern liberals, these are like our you know, nowadays kind of liberals, uh, maybe not the snowflake liberals you know, that operate around the United States, but general liberals. They still champion private property, they still champion individual liberty, but they put restrictions and believe government needed to play a role in leveling the playing field between the haves and the have-nots. Okay? The excesses of the Industrial Revolution convinced them that government action was a necessary evil. Right? They, are, they want liberty. They want individuals to be able to do what individuals do, but individuals can't do it at the expense of a whole bunch of other individuals. So government needs to get involved sometimes. Uh, the cornerstone people there are John Stuart Mill, Jeremy Bentham, and Edwin Chadwick, and I gave you the works for each of them. I didn't give you the one for, um, for Jeremy Bentham, um, and frankly, I can't remember the name of it, so I apologize, but it's, I know it was written in 1798, I just can't remember what the name of it was. Um, Bong socialism, remember we had different versions of socialism. Socialism's ends are always the same, that you move towards some social or communal sharing of property, with the established aim of from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. Bong socialists dreamed of a world in which this was true and formulated idealized visions of socialist utopias. And I wrote down the ones that we talked about. Uh, Charles Fourier, Louis Blanc, Robert Owen. Uh, and then in their own way they had blueprints for little places or little ideas where they believe Everybody can work and everybody will be happy and we'll share everything. Uh, and usually they ended up dying penniless. Or they were laughed at. It's like, all right, bullet socialism, of course, the ends, like I said, you're still trying to create that world. The means, though, 
uh, at least with Engels and Marx, is that they suggest that there is a historical in inevitability to it. Okay? Um, but that revolutionary violence is the ultimate outcome, that the proletarian class will be uh, so exploited uh, that they'll ultimately hit a threshold uh, where they can no longer take it. And they will rise up and then overthrow the order um, and then usher in that final stage. Okay. Ballot socialism is what happens at the end of the century, and that's kind of the, hey, you know what, um, I don't know if revolutionary violence is an inevitable outcome to the destruction of capitalism, and this is the Bernie Sanders version of socialism, where you form legitimate political parties with socialist agendas, uh, and then you make your party popular, and then you try to adopt those platforms. Okay, and so the Social Democrats in Germany, remember Bismarck's buddies? Uh, the United Socialists in France, the Fabian Socialists that become the Labour Party in England. Uh, Edward Bernstein is the kind of theorist that, that says, hey, Marx, you're wrong. Uh, we can achieve socialism through legitimate or democratic means. Uh, then I wrote down nationalism. Nationalism is the fraternity part. The key for you guys to remember is that nationalism has an evolution of its own. One of them is called identity. That's just people getting in touch of the, the reality that they might share experiences with other people or share languages or customs or history or geographical boundaries and that they're identifying themselves as a group. Germans, Irish, Serbs, whatever. Then political nationalism, which we start to see kind of become a thing in the middle portion of the 19th century, you know, and, and in some geographical spaces later than that, um, is now that we've identified, we want it realized. And that's where we get the young movements and the home rule movements and the unification movements and the, um, you know, wrestle away from said empire movements. Um, and then at the end, you get the, the competitive version where, all right, now we're realized as states, but now we're in that we versus they kind of world. And then, unfortunately, imperialism, militarism, um, you know, and all of those scary things uh, at the end of the century leading up to World War I happen. Okay? Where, you know, our ability to glorify ourselves is being challenged by those guys. And then there's clash. Romanticism, which is a cultural thing, um, was the other bit. Uh, and remember the way that we looked at it is that um, it's, a, it's a reaction to the Enlightenment. It's a reaction to the belief that the Enlightenment was sucking the marrow or sucking the ability to suck the marrow out of life. Uh, that it was life denying because it was creating, you know, like almost mechanical sort of existences for people. The Industrial Revolution like literally created mechanized people. You know, so that you could you you could not unduplicate your day or your experiences, and so the poets and the people that you know they wanted the heart and passion and the things that they believed made humans humans. They wanted that to be the thing. They they you know applauded the heroic because the heroic was uh, some escape from the reality that they kind of faced. You know, so they cared about the the dragon slayers and the. Um, you know, the national emancipators and the, the freedom fighters and, you know, whomever else. So, I gave you some names down there. All right, some of them are painters, some of them are writers, but, you know, you get, you get the idea. Uh, the Industrial Revolution was a horrible thing, okay? Nature was not something that one discovers the laws of. Nature was something that one appreciates the beauty of, okay? That's why you write poetry about hummingbirds and stuff. Um, or as the late Robin Williams said in Dead Poets Society, we write poetry to woo women. Because he was not at an all boys school, so it kind of made sense. Right. Um, back to our worksheet. So that's the last, I think, big thing that we had to do with this section. Okay? Um, there they all are. I don't feel like we have to do that section now, do you? Okay, so let's move on to the next one. 
Um, it says cracks in the concert of Europe. This is where conservatives have been trying to basically wipe nationalism and liberalism away, but here are some suggestions that it won't go away. All right, the revolutions of 1830, um, it starts in France, and it's basically the French um, that have now been duped into like restoring a monarchy and then realizing that that monarchy was starting to look like every monarch that they usually experienced, and then they have an uprising against them. Okay, so that was the reaction to Charles the, the Tenth, um, and then it kind of had a signaling effect on other parts of the country, uh, of Europe. Um, that's where the Belgians were like, you know, hey, we want our own country, and the Dutch were like, yeah, all right, and Poland's like, really, it was that easy? And Poland's like, we'd like our own country, and Russia's like, no, yeah. <laughs> this will not happen. <laughs> All right, Louis Philippe was the king that replaced the king. We kind of made fun of that, but France felt like we're not far enough removed from the Congress of Vienna to declare ourselves a republic. So they took another crack at another king, and that king was Louis Philippe. So he ruled France from 1830 to 1848. The Reform Bill of 1832 um, was a move where the liberals started to gain control over the conservatives in England. Remember, like, England started out real bad right after Napoleon. That's where they had the Corn Laws and the Peterloo Massacre and a whole bunch of stuff where the Tories were basically just trying to protect landed interests uh, at the expense of everybody else. The Reform Bill was extending the right to vote to the, all the middle class and trying to do some redistricting so that people's votes were actually um, sending representatives that they really wanted to vote for. Okay, so the House of Commons almost got reconfigured. Yeah, Hasib, do you have a question? No. Okay. Um, and then the revolutions of 1848, that's where, that's where all hell breaks loose because conservatism is like, no, no liberalism, no nationalism, what the hell is socialism? No socialism. <laughs> Okay, and now they're like trying to keep all those things out of gap, and they just start breaking loose. Okay, and remember the sad part was is that liberals, nationalists, and socialists knew they didn't like conservatives, but they didn't know what they were going to do. It's kind of like repealing Obamacare without being able to replace it. Okay, and that's how the liberals, the nationalists, and the socialists acted in France, the German states, Austria, Hungary, and Italy, and everywhere else, is that we know we want these changes, but we don't know how to go about making them. And then the conservatives are like, oh, it was that easy, huh? You know, and then they kind of rebounded. Okay. The next section is called the Age of Realpolitik. And we're getting close to the end here. This is awesome. Ways in which each of the following reflected the mood. The age of realpolitik is 1848 to 1870. That's the age of Cavour, Napoleon III, um, Bismarck, that group. So the first guy, Cavour, on there, um, he is a liberal politician that used war and diplomacy to unify Italy. <laughs> Napoleon III, um, awesome at domestic politics, lousy at foreign policy. Bismarck, the opposite. He wasn't lousy at domestic policy, um, but he was an amazing at foreign policy. Um, what did they write for Bismarck here? Let's see tough-minded conservative creator of the German Empire used diplomacy to maintain his creation. That's pretty good, actually. Tough-minded conservative creator of the German Empire used diplomacy to maintain his creation. Marx? I don't think, do we really need to do a definition of Marx, or can everybody handle that one? Yep. Okay. Um, 
what they said was attack the social exploitation created by the Industrial Revolution, proposed a new order that could only be achieved through revolution. Proposed a what? Proposed a new order that could only be achieved through revolution. The Crimean War, which was fought between 1853 and 56, Uh, what I would say about this, very simply, is the time when Russia's 19th century foreign policy ambitions met Britain's resistance to those foreign policy ambitions. I think that makes more sense than what they wrote, which was, New Vision of Power Politics and Diplomacy. Okay, the next one, methods of creating nation states. We're getting close and then we're going to take a break. I think we're going to finish early. So, that way you can stay for the whole thing. That brewing. Methods used by each of the following. Cavour. Okay, Cavour, remember, uh, used some manipulative wars and used diplomacy. Remember, Cavour is the one that signed Sardinia Piedmont onto um, the French and British side in the Crimean War so that he could get an audience with Napoleon in order to go to war against Austria. Bismarck, um, I would just write more manipulative wars and better diplomacy. Alexander II, um, made serious, actually I would say made semi-serious attempts at reform in Russia, and then was killed. Franz Joseph, um, the result of Franz Joseph was Ausgleich. It was to break Austria into Austria-Hungary. That happened in 1867. Lincoln. Um, what method did Lincoln use to create a nation state? Beating the South. Civil War? Yeah. Cool. Mutsuhito. Um, this one, <laughs> this one is Japanese, <laughs> this man was Japanese, um, the, if you guys remember, this was the Meiji Restoration, this is where Japan said, let's, let's join them. What? Join them as a... Meaning they industrialized, they modernized their government, and then they became an imperial power. Like super fast, like really fast and really successful. So history of Japan. Explains. I love that video. I love that video. Yeah. Yeah. We should watch that when we're done with the AP. Was that after? Um, okay, we got some industrialization here. Um, <laughs> Why is it here? Why is America just here? Yeah. Um, I'm not gonna do like a separate like thing for this. Even though we can list all the inventors and all that, we're not going to do that. Uh, so these are just general things. Number one, the political effects of industrialization were that the bourgeoisie grew in power and influence. That there was an extension of suffrage. I mean, more people were kind of invited to the political system. Um, and eventually it says uh, that the needs of the workers were responded to. I guess they mean like mid to late portions of the 19th century. Economic, you had tremendous growth of capital. Mass production. And the penetration of the world for markets and resources.
And then social you started to see mass societies. I think what they refer to there is urbanization. And then new definitions of rich and poor. The bourgeois proletariat replaced the old feudal aristocrat peasant dynamic. Um, description of the economic philosophy of industrial capitalism. Um, okay, economic liberalism. Which, of course, remember that's the Adam Smith version. Um, to kind of unshackle the economic system to allow individuals to, to profit. Um, and it said that, you know, th those ideas of economic liberalism were strengthened by ideas of social Darwinism in the late 19th century. Most of you referred to social Darwinism. Uh, in fact, all but one of you in sixth period had a chance to talk about social Darwinism. Most of you talked about Rudyard Kipling and the white man's burden. Okay. I did. Um, let's take a look at the economic philosophers here. All three that you see there are identified as classical liberals. Smith, remember, is the laissez-faire wealth of nations guy. He's the, I mean, he's one of the keynotes of classical liberalism. Locke and Smith, really, that is the foundation. They're the Lenin and McCartney of capitalism. I like Lenin and McCartney. Um, Ricardo, remember, was the iron law of wages. He's the guy that believed that if you, you know, gave workers minimum wage or a living wage, they would just have more babies. And then that would um, increase the labor supply, which would ultimately drive wages right back down into the gutter. So, it's so true. Um, Malthus, remember, believes that the population is going to outgrow the food supply. And the only thing that can stop it is that poor people got to stop reproducing. I wonder if sterilization was an option that Malthus would have been like, yes, that's the ticket. I just wrote down Malthus plus Ricardo ate four people. They, 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 they kind of do. <laughs> All right. They just don't have a lot of faith in them, which is kind of interesting because they're supposed to be like kind of instruments of the Enlightenment. But they're pretty cynical. Okay, anti corn law league. Um, this is British stuff here in the, in the D section. Um, this was English liberals that wanted to eliminate the tariff on grain and institute free trade. Liberals that wanted to eliminate the tariff on grain and institute free trade. So, or it could be a league of people that were anti the corn law. That'd be clever. The Factory Act, which was actually an act of modern liberalism, was where they started to expose um, the conditions of child labor um, and then make legislative reforms to regulate or prohibit it. The Reform Bill, again, um, is shifting control of the House of Commons to the commercial and industrial middle class. And the way that they did that was by giving the middle class the franchise. The franchise is the vote. And then the other is to reapportion commons, which is they got rid of what they called pocket and rotten boroughs. That's where people manipulate political districts so that they can send their, their representatives. Um, and then chartism. Chartism is the beginning of working class activism, I guess you could say. Uh, and their, their plans were um, to try to create a, a platform that, if followed, would have given the workers 
uh, political access, the number one thing to give them political access was universal suffrage, and then some other things that they called the People's Charter, but one of them was the secret ballot, one of them was annual elections, one of them was to pay salaries to members of the parliament. Okay, um, the last thing and then we're taking our break. And we did all that in an hour and 20 minutes. That's insane. Okay. Um, we might be done by 8.20. I'm not kidding. We are first. Yeah, but the other one goes a lot faster. It just does. All right, we're going to, this is um, the revolutions. Okay, which is kind of cool because it creates a chart, but it gives you, um, you know, kind of a look at how each of them sort of played out. So number one, the Glorious Revolution. Where did that occur? England. England. And when did it occur? 1848? 1688. You were close. You were only off by 150 years. <laughs> okay. It's the first. It's the, it's the, the kind of, yeah. It's the flagship political revolution in, in England or in Europe. Okay. 1688 England, the cause, okay, was a 17th century struggle between the king and the parliament with the ambiguously Catholic hangover. Okay, so King v. Parliament, ambiguously Catholic hangover, ambiguously Catholic legacy, whatever you want there. Uh, leadership. The Whigs and the Tories combined to oppose the King. Can anybody tell me who the Whigs are, generally? Middle. Not working class. Working class doesn't come anywhere near the vote until 1867. Tories were the old landed aristocrats. The Whigs were the liberals. They were the middle class, merchant, liberal type. They unite to oppose the king. Okay. The extremes. Um, it says treatment of dissenters and Catholics, but mostly... I would say this. I would say treatment of Catholics and Irish. They were not nice to the Irish. This thing. I mean, they were so mean that it's, it's like cranberry song kind of mean. Ever heard of the cranberries? <laughs> Get, all right, well, y'all have Spotify. Type in zombie. Listen to it on the way home. It's an angry Irish song about the troubles. I don't think so. Okay, um, the final outcome was that you have a government balance between king and parliament, and you have a constitutional structure or written constitution, whatever you prefer. All right, American Revolution, where did that occur? America. Right here in America. And this is 1775 to 83-ish. Okay, the cause was economic and political differences between American colonies and England. Or England said we should pay taxes, and we said we didn't want to. The leadership was Yankee and Virginian aristocrats. Extremes were the treatment of loyalists. And the final uh, outcome was American independence and the establishment of a classical republic classical liberal republic. 
and then France occurred in France. The cause was inept monarchy and social antagonisms. Leadership was kind of interesting. Uh, it starts out with aristocrats versus the king, followed by middle class versus the aristocrats, followed by radical middle class, sankalak, and peasants versus the other less radical middle class, followed by rebound from conservative middle class, followed by Napoleon. Now, don't worry about it. You get it. You, you know that there's layers. All right. The uh, the extremes. Um, I don't know. I mean, reign of terror. That's pretty extreme. <laughs> you know, the decapitation of nearly thirty thousand people is extreme. All right. The outcome was Napoleon. And then finally, the Russians. Number one cause, the autocratic czar, a tremendously backward country, economy, uh, and then the war. The uh, leadership was middle class intellectuals, that's the provisional government that was overthrown by the Bolsheviks. The extremes was the reds versus the whites. And the final outcome is the USSR. What country Union of Soviet so what? What countries are part of it? A lot. <laughs> All of them? Oh, yeah. I can name a few. Yeah. Um, do you really want me to do this? No, let's just go a lot of it. So, like I Russia, mean, important well, yeah. Georgia, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, okay, Ukraine, okay. Moldova, okay. Kazakhstan, okay. 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 Kazakhstan, okay. Turkmenistan, okay. Uzbekistan. All the states. All the states. All right, good. Um, uh, 1917 through roughly 22. Um, uh, the, a lot of things, but I would say too much Lysol would be the best thing to say. And then the war. The good part is that a lot of it's familiar. Um, but go back into board exam review materials and it should say, like, last worksheet or something like that. Uh, the final review worksheet, 1870 to the present. Um, if you guys are working off a of paper, that's right here. Why don't you just come up and grab one for yourself or your friends? Unless he's Chipotle. For Chipotle. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. He took one for the team. What are you doing? Anybody wants to steal it? What a mensch. That's a busy Okay, Jason. Did you steal the last thing you said? Yeah, that was the funniest thing I've ever seen. We walked it. took it. Alright, so the last. Section here is broken into like three or four pieces. Um, this one, 1870 to 1918. If you were to cut off the 1918 and put 1914, it would be probably one of the more glorious periods in European history because this is when it seems like everything's working for them. Um, so there's an age of optimism, then there's an age of omens, which tells you that there's like a, a dark, sinister underbelly to all of this great progress and, and stuff that they've got going on. But um, the very beginning here, it says material base. And the reason why they're optimistic is because Europe is enormously wealthy. 
they've got world domination. And this is, the, you know, Europe controls almost, you know, what, 60, 70 percent of the land mass on the planet at this point. Um, they have reforms as well as democratic, you know, movements. Um, large industrial growth. By this point, they're going through their second industrial revolution, which is things like uh, communications and electricity and gasoline and uh, petroleum and automobiles and electric streetcars and all of that. Um, and you know the science and technology boom. This is this is a time where that's kind of fast tracking. The non-material base for their optimism is um, there's you know the, a development of national consciousness. Um, there is ideals of democracy. There is movements towards universal suffrage. Um, and then there's art and literature, which is just kind of reflecting. You know, maybe some glorious things like impressionism is, you know, a kind of extravagant, you know, cultural flourishing. Um, then the age of almonds is like, while wow, all of that fun is happening, this horrible stuff is happening. Uh, so alliances. Remember, this is the time when the triple and the uh, triple on alliance, and then followed by the triple on pot. They're starting to, to, to divide up sides. Uh, imperialism, um, which is teaching them, you know, to use force, kind of almost in a very routine, customary way. Um, it's creating an embedded competition. It's starting to create, um, what do you call that? Um, jingoism, like almost an exaggerated love for country. Um, it's creating superiority complexes. Um, and it's starting to create the, the darkest and more sinister version of nationalism, which I'll get to in just a second. Um, for militarism, there's a preparedness for a war. <clears throat> like they're really starting to build up, you know, as if war becomes inevitable. There's an arms race. Um, the defining arms race in this lead up to World War I is between who? Germany and England, right. There's a large reservoir of trained troops, and there are new developments in weaponry. Okay. Machine guns and submarines and tanks and all kinds of you know, things that can kill a lot of people quickly. Industrialization um, provides profit for the, uh, from the arms race. If anybody's heard of the military-industrial complex, I mean, that's happening. Um, this one I always liked. It was kind of like, because it reminds me of Austin Powers, but it's the fear of being number two. Like, if you ain't first, you're last. That's two movie references in less than ten seconds. <laughs> um, the need for war to detract from the growth of socialism. When we talked about that, that was the domestic political diversion. And the need to ensure markets and resources. And then nationalism, of course, which is one of the most important pieces. Uh, an exaggerated love for country. Uh, an, implied an implied distrust or hatred for other nations. Um, that's the third stage of nationalism, the us versus them. Then there's also, while that's happening, there's a second stage of nationalism happening in the Balkans. So drives for national self-determination, particularly among Slavs. Not Slavs, but Slavs with a V. Um, major wars fought by Europeans. <laughs> okay, let's list them, shall we? Um, the Crimean War, 1853 to 56. The Seven Weeks War, 
roughly 1866. The Franco-Prussian War, 1870 to 1871. The Russo-Turkish War, 1877 to 78. The Zulu Wars. Oh my gosh, this is too I don't know the Zulu. I don't know which dates they are. Um, the Russo-Japanese War, 1905 to 1906. Um, the Balkan Wars, of which there were plenty. There was the First Balkan War, then the Second Balkan War, and then the Third Balkan War, which is known as World War I. Okay. Um, causes for new imperialism. <laughs> um, sixth period, we shouldn't have to do this, should we? Okay, so economic, just, you know, things like the need for markets, the need for labor, the need for natural resources, political, um, you know, just the testosterone thing, you know, bring some glory to the state. Social, um, one of them is the white man's burden. The other, I would say, is also the domestic political diversion. You know, driving empire is a good way to kind of keep everybody off of their own problems. It's also a means of settling some of your extra population. Because there was a lot of emigration from, from Europe uh, at the time of imperialism. Uh, defense. The need for strategic naval and coaling stations. Okay, some places, you know, you took, you took more or less just so that you could have a Navy presence. Uh, and then nationalism again. Uh, the prestige. But sometimes you just took stuff so other people wouldn't take it. You know, I'm claiming this so that I'm taking this quarterback because I know that they're looking for a quarterback. And then they'll have to trade me for it. Because the draft is okay. Imperialism at work, and this was that. Remember the responses to imperialism, or how the, like they chose different tactics of imperializing. So China, um, remember the opium, but the opium wars. Um, Africa was just outright domination, outright annexation. Uh, you could write down the Congress of Berlin, uh, which kind of laid the ground rules for the scramble for Africa. Latin America, this is American-style imperialism, not political control, but economic control. The Ottoman Empire was, and Egypt, uh, was more uh, political manipulation. And then we got some terms. Revisionist Marxism is the same thing there is um, like the ballot socialism. So the argument is, is that we shift from bullets to ballots. You guys understand that? If it doesn't make sense, say so. Okay. Um, social Darwinism, you know, the names that we use there are Herbert Spencer and Carl Pearson. And that's using Darwin's ideas to justify European domination, um, corporate exploitation, a variety of other things. Remember, it's survival of the fittest. And so if you, you buy that as a mantra, then it allows you to do whatever the hell you want. Okay, just say that it's nature. Uh, the second industrialization, or industrial revolution and corporate growth, um, this is where companies start consolidating into corporations, where finance capitalism dominates. And when you start to see a truly urban society, like the super cities.
finding like kind of the, the marriage of banks and just, you know, ventures, you know. I mean, we kind of saw that. I mean, really, finance capitalism could have been like the East India companies, you know, in it, its, its crudest form. But there's a hell of a lot more money here, and then there's, you know, like the maturity of like what we call stock markets. You know, that starts to happen too. Um, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung are two like early 20th century um, psychologists. Um, Freud was the founder of psychoanalysis. Um, remember the id, ego, superego. Uh, but he said, you know, that he's like, I guess you could say he deconstructs um, the belief that uh, about man's inherent rationality. Carl Jung, remember that just the terms that go along with him are um, archetypes and collective unconscious. And then Al Einstein, you know, and anybody else that fits in that category, you know, the, the, the so-called new physics, um, but they, they're challenging, you know, the, the capstone, you know, beliefs of Newtonian physics. Um, the age of uncertainty replacing the age of certainty. Okay. Then we've got causes of World War I. I think we've already mentioned them, but let's go again. Um, you've got alliances, imperialism, Militarism, nationalism, industrialism, and then they have one statement at the end. They said, in the summer of 1914, unreasonable militaristic forces outmaneuvered traditional reasonable diplomacy. In the summer of 1914, unreasonable militaristic forces outmaneuvered traditional reason, reasonable diplomacy. All right, and then we get a little table here. It says results of World War I for different countries. Okay. All right, so on the chart then, we're looking at um, we're just going to go political and we'll go all the way across. So for England, um, England's empire enlarged. Part of that was the mandate system. They kept all their colonies and they added some of Germany's and the Ottoman Empire's. France, same thing. Germany lost territory. Russia lost territory. Remember all that Brest-Litovsk, which was the treaty where they kind of yielded all of that stuff, like Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, some of the Ukraine, all of that territory was yielded. And then in the name of self-determination, they got their independence, although it only lasted about 20 years. <coughs> the U.S. and A, it says, returns to isolation. For four short years, the U.S. cared about other stuff. I said, nah, we're done with that. She went back. Economic. England um, crippled. <laughs> France. Um, they kind of went into bankruptcy. Just, just write bad, bad, worse. Uh, for Russia, worse than worse. For the U.S., gravy. Um, U.S. was doing really well right after World War I. They were the creditor of the world. Okay? Um, for um, social, there's, you know, like a lot of class problems because of the economy for England. For France, um, they have a republic. It actually survived. 
The Third Republic made it all the way through World War I. It's the first time that they've been involved in a war that they didn't have to create a new government. So that was a win. All right. For Germany, though, it was hell because they, they created a, a republic at the worst possible time. Um, and then that republic was discredited immediately because of the Versailles Treaty. Okay. Uh, and then Russia, of course, uh, went through revolution. <coughs> and then the U.S. was disillusioned with the war and rejected the Versailles Treaty. And then made a ton of money and then lost it all. All right, 1918 to 1945, this is some, in, in intellectual history, this is the age of anxiety, okay? Um, but we're gonna look at some specific things. Most of this is Russia stuff. So the first one, the nature of the czarist regime. Um, this is on the eve of the Russian Revolution, the first one, the March Revolution. Uh, the nature of the czarist regime, which is Nicholas II, is harsh, incompetent, preposterous, and out of touch with reality. The revolution of 1905, uh, if you remember that that was like their 1848 revolution. That's where, you know, the, the priest got shot. It was called the Bloody Sunday Massacre. Uh, and that's where the Tsar promised to make reforms, but then really didn't. So popular uprising against the government, Bloody Sunday revealed the true nature of the regime, did not succeed because the army remained loyal to the Tsar, and the Tsar promised constitutional reforms. Okay? Stolopin, if you remember that name, most of you don't, but he was the Minister of Finance right on the eve of World War I that finally gave the peasants their land. Okay. So, like it was a property, finally, because they emancipated the serfs, but then they kind of did what the U.S. did, where, you know, forget the 40 acres and a mule. Yes. And then the February-March Revolution, um, this was an outbreak in St. Petersburg that led to the collapse of Romanov rule and the beginning of the provisional government. Okay. And then the number five is just kind of, they say, steps. So, step one, um, creation of provisional government. Step two, provisional government in deep doo-doo because it is a free liberal government in the middle of chaos. Step three, Lenin returns, promising peace, land, and bread. Step four, the Kornilov affair, which was an army general trying to overthrow the... Um, provisional government before the Bolsheviks had a chance to overthrow the provisional government. Number five, the October-November Revolution. That's the Bolshevik Revolution. Number six, the creation of the Cheka and the dis dis dissolution of the Constituent Assembly. Number seven, the dissolution of the Constituent Assembly. Remember they wanted to have a vote to show how much everybody loved the Bolsheviks and then they ended up losing the vote. And so they said, well, the hell with the Constitution now. But then, so they, um, uh, then they went to war with themselves, called the Reds versus the Whites. Um, and then you have the NEP. Okay. And then Lenin. And then USSR. Then Lenin dies. Then Stalin. Okay, that's enough for that. Number one on the early Soviet Union is the NEP. The NEP was Lenin recognizing 
that the Soviet people were not ready for communism. And it says economy revived to pre-war pre levels by 1926. The Soviet attitude towards the church, kind of similar to the Jacobin attitude towards the church. Um, they saw um, traditional Christianity as being the opiate of the masses. That's what Marx had called it. And so it's a clash between their version of atheism um, and Christianity. They also believed that the Romanovs and the reason why the Romanovs were in power was because they were able to use the Orthodox Church uh, to, to pacify the people. So they associated church power with Romanov power. Okay, major steps in Stalin's totalitarian rule. Um, the elimination of Trotsky. Then the five-year plans. Then collectivization, and then the great purges. That's it. That's all. That's all you got to do to be Stalin. Four simple steps to be a Stalin. Lenin's alteration of Marxism. Okay. Um, can't reteach the course, but remember that he did two things. One of them was that Lenin created the idea of a revolutionary vanguard. This is these are people that are dedicated to the revolution that will help the workers along. Okay, and then remember that he believed that you didn't have to have mature industrial capitalism in order to have an overthrow, that you could have um, an overthrow in the cities as well as the, the countryside. Stalin's modification of Leninism, um, a couple of things. One of them was the idea of socialism in one country. And then the second was the what they call the cult of personality. So instead of dictatorship of the proletariat, it was a dictatorship over the proletariat. Then we've got the collapse of, oh wow, we're almost done. Then we've got the collapse of, oh, totalitarianism, I'm sorry. Um, definition. A complete domination of all aspects of human life by the state. So that means not just controlling politics, that means controlling everything. Culture, social life, economics. Um, the other part, remember, was called permanent revolution. That rather than it just being a temporary thing or an emergency thing, it was meant to be a permanent phenomenon that was constantly in motion. Okay. And then when they say totalitarianism of the right and totalitarianism of the left, left totalitarianism means Stalin and Soviet Union. Right totalitarianism means fascism or Nazism. And then it says collapse of the democracies, which happened almost everywhere except for some of the most mature democracies. You know, France kind of survived, the British survived, the U.S. survived, most of them didn't. Uh, and it says some collapsed from lack of tradition, like Eastern Europe. Others because of the economic strain of World War I and the Great Depression. Very difficult for, for democracy to come out of a war 
and an economic depression. Major steps in the collapse of democracy in Germany and the rise of Nazism. Number one, no tradition of democracy. The Weimar Republic was their first crack. Okay, number two, the war guilt clause. Number three, the thirteen and a half billion dollars of reparations. Number four, um, cartoon-like inflation. What am I on? Number five? Mm -hmm. The ineffectiveness of the Weimar Republic. Number six, the crash of 1929. And the last is an intense revival of nationalism. And then we've got a comparison of Vienna, Versailles, and Yalta. And then after that, it's just definitions. And then we'll be done by 825. Ready? Okay. So, Vienna. Um, Vienna was a negotiated peace treaty, whereas Versailles and Yalta were dictated terms of peace. According to Versailles and Yalta, the losers were criminals. Whereas Vienna saw the vanquished as part of the traditional fabric of European society. So he ain't a loser, he's my brother. All right, and then just a ton of terms. And then I, I can talk about anything else that you want to talk about before the board exam, because I won't see you before the board exam. Wait, what? Meaning the mock exam oh. <laughs> on Sunday. All right, we've got, let's see, 20, 27, 34, 44 terms. Okay, it's going to go fast, though. Number one, League of Nations. Anybody? It's like a rough draft UN. Okay, a collective security plan for resolving international problems. Okay. Crude rough draft of you will. Rapallo. Um, specifically, the Treaty of Rapallo was dealing with um, border disputes between Italy and Yugoslavia. But it was also talking about armaments, which is the beginning of that spirit of Locarno stuff, which is actually the number three. Okay? So Rapallo was 20, 1923. Locarno was 1924. Locarno was, was agreements on the reduction of weapons and the, redu the recognition of borders. That included Germany, France, Belgium, Luxembourg. Remember, there's a period in between 1924 and 1929 where Europe was kind of getting along. They're working their stuff out. Locarno was a big part of that. The Dawes Plan, another big part of that. That was um, the uh, United States getting off Keynesian. Okay. Remember me talking about like helping them pedal the bike so that. Germany could grow and then pay off its debts, and then Britain and France could grow and pay off their debts. Okay. Um, Kellogg Briand was the, you know, pass the joint around the campfire and outlaw of war. I shouldn't say it should be <laughs> Popular fronts. Uh, this is something that happened in the 1930s, but particularly in countries that have uh, coalition-style governments. 
but popular fronts were designed to be um, kind of like anti-fascist. And you saw them in France and Spain. It's a combination of left and center and bringing them together so that they sort of mimicked what Roosevelt's New Deal would have looked like, except one of them was uh, France, 36, 37, and one of them was uh, the alternative to Franco. But unfortunately, Franco had Hitler and Mussolini on his team. Third Reich. Third Reich was Hitler's 1,000-year empire that lasted 12. Nineteen thirty three to nineteen forty five. Anschluss. Oh, Franco is the uh, the I guess I don't know. The kind of like green tea version of fascism that developed in Spain. Um, the right wing victor of the Spanish Civil War established a fascist regime, but didn't really look like Hitler too much. Anschluss was uh, the unification of Germany and Austria. This was in 38. That was part of Hitler's plan of bringing all the Germans together. The Munich Conference, very important. This was um, the symbol of appeasement, but Hitler wants Sudetenland, France and Britain give it to him he pinky swears that he's done with requests and then invades Czechoslovakia. The anti common turn pact, the other name for that is um, the triple axis. But that's bringing the Japanese, the Italians, and the Germans together in an alliance that claimed itself to be just anti communist. Um, the Nazi-Soviet Pact was a 10-year non-aggression pact between the Soviets and Germany that lasted 20 months. The Atlantic Charter, um, Hitler meets, I'm sorry, Roosevelt meets Churchill. Uh, they discuss the post-World War they discussed the post-war world order. Uh, say this time we listen to Wilson, and they did that before the U.S. got into the war, which is kind of cool. Let's talk about what happens after the war before we get into the war. Kind of jump in the gun a little bit, but what else? Sometimes you just call it confidence. It's like Steph Curry hit the three and then turn it and run back on defense before the shot lands. Very cool. I always wanted to do that. There was a commercial. There's a commercial where um, where Paul George throws one up and then like he throws the shot up and everybody's watching it and then he walks off the court and then grabs a Gatorade and starts drinking it. And says game over. Swish. That's pretty cool how he gets all that done. All the shots in the air. That's pretty cool too. All right. Um, Pearl Harbor. Um, something. Okay. Nice naval base in Hawaii. Um, Stalingrad. Um, I think probably most important military turning point during the war. Soviet victory uh, turned the war in favor of the Allies. Uh, D-Day. Okay, and then Yalta. Yalta was the, um, a lot of people believe that's where Roosevelt, a war-weary Roosevelt, um, over-consumed with fear of the Japanese ending, um, 
essentially concedes Eastern Europe to Stalin. But remember when we talked about this stuff, and it wasn't that long ago, we were talking about how Roosevelt seemed to be completely focused on World War II, uh, and Churchill had already started transitioning to uh, what happens next. Um, San Francisco was the UN. <coughs> Potsdam um, is where um, Truman meets Stalin and that Cold War tensions kind of at least come out of the woodwork a little bit. Nuremberg, of course, is the trials for the German political, civil, and uh, military leaders for their war crimes. It's where we start like looking at violations of law during war, start creating a template for what you know, those things mean. Crimes against humanity, genocide, uh, war crimes. We start creating international statements on, uh, on what those things are. Um, okay, and then 1945 to the present, here's a, hu a handful of things that are Cold War related. One of them is called the Cold War. Um, yeah. The Cold War, I mean, I don't seems like it's kind of broad, but um, the Allied powers of the left and center succeeded in eliminating the right, but now came apart. So left, Soviets, center, Britain, France, U.S. versus right, Japan, Germany, Italy, vanquished the right and now kind of turn on each other. The Truman Doctrine, 1947, the U.S. military aid to oppose the spread of communism in Greece and Turkey. But this is the development of what they called containment policy. And the United States basically says we're no longer isolated in the world. We are now the police. Marshall Plan, um, U.S. economic aid to combat the spread of communism in Western Europe. And if you know what this stuff is, you know, as long if you don't, you know, then then write some things down. A common form um, we didn't talk about, but this is um, kind of like the Soviets' version of the CIA a little bit. You know, it's a, it's a foreign policy instrument to try to uh, promote communist regimes around the world. Uh, a propaganda vehicle, if you will. NATO, of course, which is the uh, entangling alliances, but the West. Does anybody remember what started, what initiated that? NATO? It's when the Soviets uh, took the tanks into Czechoslovakia. That's when all the West kind of got nervous. All right, Warsaw Pact, of course, which is the answer to NATO. The problem of a divided Germany, um, we sh I showed you how kind of strange it was, but the fact that West Berlin is like this little sliver of island in the middle of East Germany um, kind of made it weird okay. and created some flashpoints, one in 1948, one in 58 through 1962, and then one in 1989. All right, this is like the decolonization version. Uh, post-World War II, the non-Western world. Uh, China, remember that there was a communist takeover. That's where Mao beats Chiang. Um, in a Cold War context, that was considered a big L for the U.S. Um, Korea. It really hasn't been important. Nothing has happened. Nobody talks about Korea. <laughs> Japan. That was sarcasm. Enforced Western style democracy prevented Russian participation. Uh, the United States vigorously said, We would remake you, Japan, in our own image, and turn you into a bludgeoningly capitalist state. India. Uh, the partition of India and Pakistan, the growth of socialism and military dictatorships. Um, a 
Gulf states became nuclear in 2003. Does that sound right? I feel like they became nuclear much, much later. Uh -huh. Maybe 98. Somebody check. I can't remember. I, maybe it is 98. Which to you guys was a long time ago. 1970. I was, yeah, alive. What? Wow, yeah. Um, on the morning of May 18, 1974, in the Pokhara Desert, the ground shook violently as India conducted its first atomic bomb. And when did Pakistan have theirs? Pakistan um, 98. 98? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> Middle East. Um, <laughs> And predominantly until recently with the Arab Spring and, and then Iraq and then all of that other stuff, but it was primarily Arab uh, states versus Israel. Uh, but now it's become much more dynamic. Um, Vietnam, the end of French colonialism, and then the power vacuum um, that led to U.S. intervention. And then Africa. Um, Decolonization, uh, but certainly you created a really bad situation as everyone's trying to figure out how to deal with the post colonial era. Uh, also, keep in mind that Africa became a, another pillar in the Cold War rivalry. Um, and then we got some random stuff. Uh, the Holocaust, anybody heard of that? Or, or how about the European common market? That's stuff like, um, you remember the ECSC, the Schumann Plan, and then the Treaty of Rome that created the EEC, but that's European integration. That was the stuff that kind of lays the, the ground uh, for the EU. Um, the Vatican Council II and Pope John the Twenty Third. This is I didn't talk about this, but this is between 1963 and five. The Roman Catholic Church kind of tried to get real, kind of get you know recent woke. It's a good <laughs> word for it. Um, and so they started proposing a dialogue. Uh, they started like it was almost like the Pope became Gorbachev, if that makes sense. Uh, they wanted dialogue, they wanted openness, they wanted reconciliation with their old enemies, they wanted to make modifications in some of the things that they did. Pope John the Twenty Third was one of the, you know, the crucial pieces in that. Okay? I would say that he's like in the top five of cool popes. You know, Francis right now, I would say. <laughs> Until he met Jim Harbaugh, then I kind of remember. <laughs> Um, existentialism, uh, this is just part of the post-World War II uh, intellectual climate, um, but just the idea that universals don't really exist and that people have to derive their own meaning through their own subjective experiences. Um, the SALT treaties, if you hear the acronyms SALT or START, they're referring to nuclear arms reduction um, dialogue ultimately movement. Detente, remember, is a period in the late 60s through the mid-70s um, where there was a thawing in the tensions in the Cold War. Um, Willie Brandt was one of the key figures in Detente. Nixon's visit to China was a key piece. Uh, the SALT talks, the Helsinki Accords, um, Glasnost and Perestroika, remember those are the cornerstone pieces of Gorbachev's kind of put the Lysol cans away. Um, that ultimately ends up creating um, the end of the Cold War. Uh, the 1989 revolutions follow, um, and then the disintegration of the Soviet Union. Now there isn't any terms per se um, for anything past that. But that leaves us at 1990, and that doesn't account for the last 26 years. Okay, so um, just some things to think about.
because I didn't really get a chance to do that. Um, number one, certainly the formation of the EU, and now we're kind of watching the, the unraveling, if you will, of the EU. Um, although we don't know if Marine Le Pen will win. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen in Germany, although the Russians apparently are working pretty hard at throwing those. Um, but um, the reasons for a lot of that are things that you might get some questions on. One of them might be just looking at, I, it wouldn't be a shock to see like a multiple choice question that has like an excerpt where you might see something about um, like one of the, the shootings or a bombing or something that they could say, oh, well, these are radical groups and maybe some of them are radical Islamic groups and that starts to change mindsets about the fact that Europe has open borders and that there's a lot of movement uh, and that in times of economic distress, that's when everybody gets all nativist, okay? If they feel like, you know, there's job opportunities that are taken away or if they feel like there's safety issues, um, that's when they start to, you start seeing these ultra-right movements uh, happen. It's not the first time in history and it's certainly not going to be the last. All right. It just so happens that some of the offshoots of the Syrian war in particular, um, and um, maybe you could say some of the, the, the late damage of the Iraq war have created some really discomforting experiences in Europe and now everybody's antennas are up. Um, so you could get some questions about that. You could get some questions about you know, whether this European cooperation um, is now starting to come unraveled and everybody's retreating back to nationalism. Um, you could get questions about the war on terror. You could definitely get questions about what happened in Eastern Europe after the Soviet Union collapsed. You could get questions about how uh, Vladimir Putin has started to re, uh, reconfigure Russia to look like Russia again. You could get some questions about Yugoslavia, which I talked about, and how Yugoslavia kind of started to break up into these little pieces, and that actually created a lot of damage. Um, it's the one part of Hasib's essay that I was begging for, uh, because his essay was about con continuity and change regarding minorities. And a lot of people didn't know what to do with that question. Uh, Hasib rightly pointed out that you know Jews in particular throughout the 20th century had targets on their back. All right, it started with the Dreyfus affair, mm -hmm. which Hasib didn't talk about using the terms Dreyfus affair, but described the whole. Thing. <laughs> I didn't remember the name. And, and then obviously you can talk about how that ultimately got ratcheted up to become the Holocaust. And then you could talk about maybe some of the anti-Israeli backlash in the late 40s. Um, and then he talked about the fact that, you know, as Europe started to kind of integrate, that there was more of a welcoming vibe that was happening uh, where, you know, through decolonization, like a lot of African, um, you know, workers started to come into Europe and other places. But one of the things that I would have mentioned was like, how Muslims as minorities in Bosnia, Croatia, and some of those places um, were the targets. And that there was genocide that was committed against minorities through these ethnic cleansing measures, which then gives you some, the more things change, the more things stay the same, because that's at the tail end of the, 19, uh, the, the 20th century. And that would have been a really good last body paragraph. So, I mean, I appreciate you being the one that had the courage uh, to try something different. Nobody chose that last question, um, which is unfortunate because you had a lot to write about. I mean, it's just you could have talked about the Schmalkaldic League, you could have talked about the German princes, you could have talked about the Huguenots, you could have talked about um, the role. There was a lot to write about in the first question. And we did. That we did. Well, what was the it's kind of about old imperialism and new imperialism. Uh, right? um, the, first, the first period class got two pieces of art, which were almost obvious um, about which one represented which. But you did have to do the work to actually explain the attributes, and I think most people did. 
Um, then there was the scientific revolution question, but most people weren't handling the turning point aspect of it, where you have to show a world, and then you have to show a world after. The only one that did that with really any kind of effectiveness was Jason. Right, so way to go. Um, and I don't remember what the other one was. Probably because nobody did it. No. That was the nationalism one. Oh, yeah. I think Max. Oh, there was a few on the nationalism one. Did. And I thought that was a pretty easy question, really. Because um, there was a lot that you could have talked about. Um, do you still have any copies of uh, Albert's one? Yeah, everyone did one except for me. And I talked to um, everyone. It's like I did one. They're all in the, they're all in the, the, the folder here. Yeah, right here. So guys, look at this. All three worksheets that we've had so far are in here. And then the things that we've kind of riffed off of are also in here. All right? Um, I'm not going to be here tomorrow. I told you that. Um, I still expected first period to finish those three essays. All right? So if you had questions four, five, and six, I've instructed, I think Martin's going to be here. Um, or either that or Daniel's going to be here, Daniel Brown. Uh, but I expect you guys to educate each other on how you would approach those three essay questions. All right? So if you had questions four, five, and six, and you're in here and you represent those three questions, six period, I think we got through all of it. Yeah. Yeah. Except the last one. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the other thing is, though, and I know, you know, obviously, Momo, you're not going to be here this weekend. Uh, but all of y'all, all of y'all that can be here, please be here, okay? Um, the other thing is, is that I did make a promise to you all that I would give you bonus points for being here. So sign in, and then I'll see you guys later. Seriously? I know I ate 20 minutes. Oh, you're the bot? You broke curfew for me. Well, if you get curfew. If you get curfew. Or not. I'm 22 minutes. Why does it take you 20 minutes? You have her all right here. Wait, why do you have 20 if you have 9?